she waded into the political fray. At one dinner, she warned the French ambassador to mind her ambitions. There never was a woman bolder than I. I have unbridled audacity. Peter and Catherine drifted from distant relations to open hostility. The Tsar-to-be warned that once he succeeded Elizabeth on the throne, he might lock his wife in a convent or dispose of her entirely. But while her husband threatened, Catherine built defenses and planned for the future. She forged alliances with generals and politicians throughout the empire and across Europe. In 1758, Catherine's growing web of influence caught the attention of the Empress Elizabeth. To cover her tracks, Catherine burned her journals and correspondence. Then she met the Tsarina for a private conference to discuss Catherine's loyalty and Elizabeth's unsatisfactory heir, Peter. It certainly had been planted in Catherine's mind that she might like to be empress in her own right. So there, were, there was plotting and people who recognized Peter as being incompetent, um, uh, feared despotic tendencies in his character, uh, rallied around Catherine. While Peter and Catherine sparred, the Empress Elizabeth's armies marched into battle. The Empire's enemy, Prussia, and its warrior king, Frederick the Great, a man the German-born Grand Duke Peter had idolized all his life. Prussian conquests had shaken Europe's balance of power. Elizabeth had joined an alliance to quash Frederick's upstart Germanic Empire. By 1761, Russian forces had gained the upper hand. In St. Petersburg, heroes from the front returned to adoring throngs. The greatest hero of them all, the guardsman Grigory Orlov, swept the Grand Duchess Catherine off her feet. Grigory Orlov was the second of the five Orlov brothers, all of whom were handsome, all of whom were reckless, all of whom were dashing. Uh, and Catherine fell in love with the said Gregory Orloff, uh, and um, uh, he was the one who uh, helped organize the guards to support her bid for the throne. Catherine and the Orloff brothers dubbed Peter the monster. They despised his childish ways and Prussian fixation. As the year ended, events came to a head. At the front, the Russian army had overrun Berlin. Frederick the Great was on his knees. His German kingdom was about to be wiped off the map. At the palace, Grand Duke Peter was in despair at the impending defeat of his beloved Prussia, while his Aunt Elizabeth was poised for victory. Then came Christmas Day. Elizaveta Petrovna Romanova, 52 years old, sole surviving child of Peter the Great, Tsarina and Empress of Russia, fell dead. Elizabeth really had created the modern Russian European type court. European court was unthinkable without women, and women had not been at all prominent at the Muscovite court. In many ways, Empress Elizabeth, despite her flaws, was a role model for Catherine on that, w that a woman can be in charge and have power. The Empress's nephew and heir to the throne, the German princeling Peter III, danced for glee at Elizabeth's funeral. In his first act as Tsar, Peter declared peace with Prussia, sparing his hero Frederick from annihilation and infuriating the entire Russian army. And the new Tsar wouldn't stop there. He ordered the officer corps out of the Russian green uniforms he hated and dressed them in Prussian blue. He stripped the icons out of the Russian Orthodox Church he feared and ordered the priests to dress like German Lutheran ministers. And in a final foolhardy adventure, Peter ordered up an invasion force to claim the German homeland he had left 20 years before, the distant Duchy of Holstein. One night, Tsar Peter toasted his impending crusade. When his wife Catherine failed to raise her glass, Peter announced to all that her time had run out. He was threatening to divorce Catherine, send her to a nunnery, and leave her without anything. And so Catherine realized uh, that the moment had come also for her to act. 
The next night, Catherine's lover, Gregory Orloff, his brothers, and their fellow guardsmen led a coup to save Catherine and Russia. They deposed Peter with ease. But for the hapless ex-Tsar, the worst was still to come. If you are an empress, the only good ex-emperor is a dead ex-emperor. To keep Catherine's hands clean, Orloff and his brothers dragged Peter out of St. Petersburg. The conspirators' hatred soon got out of hand. A letter to Catherine from Orloff broke the news. The monster was dead. In July of 1762, Peter III, the Tsar of Russia, suffered an unfortunate, fatal accident. He collided with the ambitions of his wife, Catherine the Great. The official word was that he had died of hemorrhoids, an odd disease to pick, but nonetheless, after he was killed, it became even more important uh, that she establish that she was the savior of Russia and that he was going to crucify Russia. To depose an unpopular ruler was one thing, but for a German princess to claim the Tsar's crown, Catherine would have to transform herself and the Russian nation. How did Catherine have the chutzpah to think that she could rule, the hubris indeed? Well, again, I think she knew she had the talent and she had the back backing, and she had become Russian. She certainly saw herself as legitimate, that she was the competent person, that she was devoted to Russia and Russia's interests, and that she saved Russia from disaster. For more than half her life, Catherine had forged allies and studied the path to power. Like her model, the Empress Elizabeth, Catherine seized the throne with a coup. Then, to consecrate her authority, she headed to the cathedrals of the Kremlin to be crowned. She immediately orchestrated a brilliant coronation in which she was celebrated as elected by the people. And then she embarked upon a program of reform. That was how you demonstrated your fitness for the throne after Peter the Great. You reformed. You became a reforming Tsar. At 33 years old, a German princess had claimed the authority of the Russian emperor. The Empress Catherine the Great's lust for knowledge and power would prove to be the stuff of legend and the engine of history. She filled the rooms of St. Petersburg's palaces with art by the great masters, turning her hermitage into the world's greatest museum. She collected admirers like she stockpiled art, powerful friends and devoted lovers, men she used to cement her hold on power, and ease the burdens of imperial rule. Her hunger for land expanded the empire in almost every direction. From Eastern Europe to Alaska and America's Pacific Northwest, Catherine reigned supreme. Above all, she pursued reform. She promoted local government. She chartered schools and universities. She encouraged Russia's elites to challenge tradition in so doing, lit the fuse for revolutionary change in Russia. The entire Russian elite felt as though they were having a honeymoon period with her because they discovered that finally they had an empress who spoke the same language as they did, the language of the Enlightenment, who had the same goals as they did, namely to make Russia a state based on law, not based on personal rule, uh, and they applauded this empress of theirs. Catherine seized the Russian throne in 1762, in the Age of Enlightenment. Philosophers and writers heralded the rights of man and the belief that reason could perfect human society. Catherine saw herself as a priestess of the liberal movement. Liberty, the soul of everything. Without you, all is dead. Yet the rights of man confronted the Empress Catherine with a dangerous paradox. For in Russia, where the economy was built on the slave labor of the serfs, human rights was an explosive ideal. 
And it's precisely because you have...